many local caregivers. Thank you. I am very excited uh, to welcome our panel of speakers today. Uh, Linda, Larry, and Debbie, I'll ask you to put your cameras and your microphones on. So today we are to, and let me, let's see how we're gonna do this. Nope, give me just one second, folks. Uh, Linda, I mean, Christina. Yep. I think I need to be invited again. Okay. It, it won't let me click the start video. All right, hang on one second. Sorry, folks. There you go. There she is. Okay. All right. So without further ado, I'm really happy to welcome this um, excellent panel of caregivers who are so generous to share their time and their caregiving experiences with you in the hope that we can pass on something that will make your journey uh, a little bit easier. So um, I'm going to ask my guests to introduce themselves. Um, Linda, let me go ahead and start with you. Linda Estrada Palma. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about I did home care for my mother, Nancy. I don't know if you can see her there. Mm -hmm. She lived with me for the last eight years of her life. She passed away last July, but I was able to care for her at home. She was in and out of the hospitals for various things and we did rehab, but every time I was able to bring her home. So I will share and answer any questions regarding home care the best that I can. Perfect, thanks Linda. How about you, Larry? Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I was fortunate enough, my family was fortunate enough to have three sets of parents around until their 80s and uh, one of them in their 90s. Um, parents are divorced and remarried. My dad's a snowbird. Uh, him and my stepmom traveled back and forth from New York to Florida, visiting us and my brothers and sisters on their way. My mom and stepdad lived right here in Middletown. I live in Myersville. And we eventually had to move them into assisted living. And my mom uh, moved into independent living in the same facility. And then my mom and uh, my mother and father-in-law also live here in Frederick. Uh, they're fully independent. And uh, so that's, that's what I have to offer. Perfect. Thanks, Larry. And Debbie Thaxton. Hi everyone, I'm Debbie Thaxton. I live here in Frederick. Um, I'm retired now. I retired um, in 2014 in part to care for my dad, um, but I still feel like I work full time a lot of days. Uh, I supported my dad for six years from about 2015 to 2021 while he lived independently in a rambling old house on 22 acres in a small town called Paul Paul, West Virginia, named for the Paul Paul fruit. Mm -hmm. um, early in the dementia journey, I visited probably once a month. And um, in addition to providing socialization, I did the bills, I cleaned the house and that kind of thing. And then through those six years, I increased that to going up every two weeks to do the same kinds of things because he was still pretty together and um, pretty independent. Then COVID hit, like many of you, trying to get to visit and trying to get to make plans was much more difficult. So I stopped visiting for a short while due to the worry of uh, bringing germs from Frederick County into West Virginia and so forth. Um, beginning in January of 2021, um, after I'd resumed visiting regularly, I could see that the dementia was increasing and I started visiting uh, about once a week and I'd spend the whole day there with him. Um, it's an hour and a half drive each way. Um, finally, we couldn't wait anymore for COVID to disappear and lighten up the restrictions that were in place in the assisted living facilities. So I started visiting those and trying to find the best fit for him. We moved 
booked him here about a year ago and um, placed him in assisted living. And the very first night he tried to escape to walk back to Paul Paul and um, he went into the memory care side of the facility. So it's been a journey and I hope to have some answers to some of your questions. Well, thank you all. So Larry and Debbie, I'm gonna start with you and the experience of caring for somebody um, at a distance. And Larry, I'll start with you. What would you say was the biggest challenge you faced trying to care for um, your parents, particularly the ones in Florida, but even the ones closer, you weren't living in the same home. What were the challenges? Communication. Uh, you know, he, my dad had Alzheimer's and he progressed from being uh, very sharp. His, he was an engineer, uh, it was his occupation and he was, he evolved into no longer able to drive. We, we had to deal with uh, getting his license taken away. Um, and communication was really the, the biggest key to, to knowing what was going on because my stepmom uh, just kind of let dad handle everything. So the, the, the challenge that evolved was we started to find out that they weren't paying bills. Uh, there was a lot of issues with their finances. So, and, and just discovering all that stuff, uh, you know, Florida is a long ways off, mm -hmm. New York, is a long ways off, a lot closer, but still just the communication was, was, was really essential. What did you ever, was there a, a, a tool or a strategy? Did you ever, how did you mitigate that? Or do you have a suggestions for people who might be facing something like that? Well, early on when my dad started to lose uh, his, his faculties, we, tried to address it while he was still capable of making a decision on his own. And that's how we presented it to him. My sister, Bonnie and I flew to Florida and told dad, you know, there's some decisions that need to be made, dad and, and my stepmom, Margie, there's some decisions here that have to be made, dad, while they're your decisions to make. And we may have waited too long because he really didn't make any decisions. Um, so, you know, it, it's, that is one thing I would stress is getting a plan in place ahead of time and I, get your parents to make the decisions that, and, and they don't want to do it. You know, that, that's the hardest part to overcome right. that objection. And most caregivers don't want to have that conversation, but you make a good point that dementia process or a health process, you don't, none of us has a crystal ball to know. So the the sooner you tackle that bull head on um, to let them make some important decisions, uh, the earlier you you broach that, the better. So hands on, you know, being there and physically starting to review their finances, you start to see the collection notices because bills are being paid late. The only way you see that stuff is if you visit. So mm -hmm. that, that I think is really important. So plenty of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> Uh, Larry, if you could do something different with that, that distance experience, um, what would you do differently? Start sooner. Start sooner. Yeah. Good advice. And, you know, we see it now. We have a financial advisor and they've got a document they have us sign that says that if they detect that we're starting to lose our faculties, who do, who do they contact? So, Interesting. You know, that, that's really, nobody, it's hard to see your own decline, you know, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so it, you're better off having those, those difficult conversations earlier rather than later. Good advice. Debbie, how about you? What were some of the biggest challenges you faced when your dad was still in West Virginia? Well, um, probably the most difficult thing was trying to problem solve one of his issues without being able to see it myself. From simple things like the TV remote, mm -hmm. um, trying to help him get the channel that he is looking for, or any channel, using a remote that you don't even know how to understand and use yourself was very, very difficult. 
So one of the things that I did consistently and every time I was up there was to take pictures with my iPhone. Um, and I would come back home and uh, have those pictures to help guide me to answer his questions and his, solve his problems. So I've sent a few of those pictures to Christina and I'll give you an idea because a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, the TV remote was, okay, those are ones Oops. about food. Let's go with the TV remote. There you go. I probably over the course of two to three years referred to that picture hundreds of times. And those are my knees and that's just <laughs> me taking a picture of that just before I left. You know, it's a different service than we use and it's, you know, totally different than what I have here. Not that I'm very good at the one that I have here, but. But you could say dad pushed the yellow button and, exactly. and you were both talking about the same thing. Excellent. Exactly. So that solved a lot of problems, just taking pictures of common things that would be difficult during the week. Um, another example is the microwave. You wouldn't think a microwave would be truck, and I don't have a picture of the microwave okay. there, but a microwave can be difficult to understand how to use mm -hmm. when your memory is declining. And it's very simple for all of us, but not so much for him. And if you think about it, a microwave is like a lifeline to someone who can't cook mm -hmm. and, um, I was um, constantly trying to coach him through what to push, how long, be careful about taking it out. Um, another thing I would suggest is open up the wallet and take a picture of the front and back of every single card. Now that was early on because he still had all of his cards. He was driving, he was managing, but this way, if I had to call the Discover card people, I had, you know, the number and all of the contacts that they needed to talk to me. Even after I got the power of attorney paperwork in place, they would still ask for all of that kind of information uh, because they have to prove in 16 different ways that you are who you say you are talking about your father to that, to that organization. Um, Late in the game, um, now again, he lived on 22 acres and had six outbuildings that he liked to go to and tinker. And now as I reflect back, I think he was part of the wandering phase of the mid stage, which was okay because it's his property. But um, about a year and a half ago, he started having trouble remembering which key went with which lock. So Christina, if you can show that picture, that helped. Oh, you know what, Debbie? I think I missed that picture. I apologize. Oh, that was okay. a good picture. <laughs> what I did was took all my fingernail polish up there, all the wild colors that you have and never use. And I would paint a little dot on the key that went with the lock. And that would help him to figure out um, how to open the lock and look inside. Um, at one point we had some home care coming in and that's a good picture to see because even though they were people, the next slide, I think. Yes, even though well, that top picture is me and my husband, my brother and his wife, because as much as you hate to think about it, um, even in the middle stage, they start having difficulty recalling who those people are, like your, your brother's wife your sister-in-law. So if they were coming up to visit, we would talk about those two pictures so that he would have that fresh and before they got there to visit. The others were caregivers and um, uh, siblings. The, the bottom picture is his younger brother and his wife. And those helped us a lot too. And if I didn't have that picture with me, I wouldn't remember myself which one was which. Do you the see caregivers. what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. He would look at it and go, well, who is that per who's this person coming to the door? And I could say, 
oh, it's Bethany. She's the OT who's coming to help work with you. And so then he would, we would look down, I'd say the fourth one down and he could find Bethany. So those kinds of pictures, including the one on the calendar, um, really helped me help him navigate his independence. Um, another challenge was finding the needed caregiving support for dad, partly because he lived in a small town. Um, it's amazing, 40 minutes to Cumberland, Maryland and 40 minutes to Winchester and most of the places like Visiting Angels and Right at Home would say, no, we don't have anyone who will go into Paw Paw uh, because it's so small and they may have only one client and it didn't make sense for them to go in there. So that was a difficult issue for me, finding caregiving support, partly for that reason, but also because his... Um, his friends and relatives were all in their 80s. So how are you going to use them to help care for him when they're having their own problems with their own families and such? And then I don't know if anyone else will um, mention this, but we physically couldn't do another winter in the house. The winter of 2021, we had a, a number of good snowstorms and the caregivers I had, of course, were local people from churches and neighbors and such. And they would just say, I can't make it there. It's snowing. And so what do I do an hour and a half away? Several times I went to, to Paul Paul to pick him up and drive back while it was already snowing. Um, but those were three of the biggest issues, navigating the weather, navigating troubleshooting problems that you can't see yourself and finding caregivers to support them. Thanks, Debbie. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda, I'm gonna stop this share. Um, Linda, let me go to you um, and talk about that experience of having your mom in your own space for all those years. Well, mom, little by little, started with sundowning and when she was 85, she had fallen and had to have a reverse shoulder replacement. And a couple of years after that, she got sepsis from a blocked bladder and had to have an operation and go to rehab. And then last year she broke her femur bone and that was major, went in rehab and two months later, that's when she passed. Every time she had to go to the hospital, they said the anesthesia is really hard on the elderly. And her son, she had sundowning, not full dementia or anything like that. So that was a lot of my challenge is in the evening, her being tired, she would get um, mean and more verbally mean. So it was more me trying not to take that personally. And my family was so good of supportive of that. And then the next day it would be like, she never knew she said anything, you know, and oh, Linda, thank you for helping me. And, you know, things like that. M my, um, my struggle was also keeping her engaged and not bored with us being at home and she couldn't drive. So I found, I would schedule a lot of her friends. Mom loved to talk to her friends and I scheduled phone calls or I would do FaceTime if they had that capability on the other end. Um, I'd set up family dinners and my brothers would come and visit all the time or take turns calling every night. Um, she loved to do word searches and she liked to do solitaire and my cousin gave her uh, a tablet computer and she actually mastered it. And <laughs> it was really good stimulation for her. She really liked that. And she would get so excited when she won. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she loved TV game shows, things like Wheel of Fortune and America Says where she could kind of participate and it wasn't anything really difficult like Jeopardy. 
Um, so things like that really helped with the boredom. Um, personally, for me, the struggle was my exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And that was my own fault of thinking, oh, I can do it all. And I, my, my thing that I learned that I should have done quicker was asking for help. And I did that at the insistence of my brothers and their support. So <laughs> would you say that would be your biggest recommendation to someone who is caregiving, yeah. whether I guess you're away yes. at a distance or at home, but yes, because you feel like, oh, it's, I know her best. I can do it best. You know, it's hard to have someone come into your home, you know, into your private life and everything. But then once I did, and I can address that later with some of the other questions, but once I did, I'm like, what, what took me so long? <laughs> this was so good for both mom and I, you know? So um, that, that's pretty much, oh, and then having my other challenge was with myself having patience with mom and myself, especially when you're so tired and exhausted and she's got her, maybe her days and nights mixed up and she's waking up at night, not falling back asleep. I would put on the TV with music to kind of lull her, but yet it was something she could watch, you know? And I bought a baby video monitor. My daughter had one and that helped me so much because I could, go back to bed, have the video on and know that she was okay in bed, not getting up or, or anything like that. Or if she called me in the middle of the night, I would hear her right away. And I didn't have to sleep in her room because in the beginning, that's what I was doing. And that was just very exhausting. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So oh, all of you already, you know, we're 15 minutes in so many yeah. wonderful suggestions. Um, I want to talk really uh, uh, quickly a little bit, Debbie, you already mentioned some of the issues with home care, um, but Debbie, you spoke to the fact about people not being there when they're supposed to be there. You've got weather issues. Larry, did you have any other challenges with home care from a distance or recommendations or suggestions for folks? Well, my dad pretty much uh, lived with my stepmom. Uh, and he lived when he, when we had to move him back to New York, they lived with my stepbrother. So there was a, a presence there to monitor them. My mom and stepdad went through a phase where they had home care. My stepfather had Parkinson's and it got difficult for him. Uh, he, he always, he couldn't remember things. Uh, I mean, when he moved into assisted living, he, he couldn't even remember the red button on his uh, device was the call button for mm -hmm. help, you know, so it, it just, it, it got difficult in, in, in that. Uh, but the home care, we had to deal with resentment. My mother resented having uh that person there in the house even though she was unwilling to do the things and she's the same age as him i mean he was a year younger than her in the early 80s so so she was the healthy one and resented that caregivers were coming in to take care of her husband she did and she was rather hostile at times <laughs> so that's a very real reality for people and you're trying to broker between the the agency and the, yeah. the aide who's feeling slighted and your mom Mm -hmm. Not easy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Linda, you started to talk a little bit about the home care. What were some of the challenges or the um, solutions that you found? Well, how we approached it with mom is I said I needed a plan B for myself that what if something happened to me if I fell and broke my leg mm -hmm. or had to go into the hospital? I needed a plan B as to who would take care of her. So I approached, let's find out about some of the temporary assisted livings in our area. And she was very receptive to that. And, I, and, and when I was doing that type of research is when the elder service had the expo mm -hmm. and I went 
And that was so helpful. And I stress that to people, reach out, any type of networking at those type of places you can go. When I was there, I got this resource directory that's from the Frederick, Senior Frederick Services. County Senior Services Division. This is the actual one when I went to the expo. And when I was at the expo, that's when I found out about Daybreak that Christina is the director of. And I, I went and had an appointment and mom started going there two days a week. And she liked it so much, she asked to go three days a week. And it was great for her having a little independence away from me, but I was able to be Linda for six hours a day. <laughs> I took her and then she started coming home on the bus. So things like this, and, it, and in this book is so many resources and things on rehab places, assisted living, counseling. It's just invaluable what they have there. I found so many things in here for myself on senior tax credits and for property tax and that saved me nine hundred dollars last hey, year. That's great. So I will just I mean, I'm gonna say I'm not folks sure, Christine, can people get this like at the library or can it's they just call gonna say it if if you call them 301 600 1234 600 1234 and ask okay. for the blue book and they will yes. happily send you a copy. So this was my my beginning lifeline and I I, I, ref, I have, I lived in, Crest, I live in Crestwood retirement community. We're in single family homes and we have clubhouse and uh, it's not assisted living at all, but there's so many people that have had to leave here and do it or families are asking. And, and we have these now up at our clubhouse. And that's the first thing I'll tell people, go grab this. And then use it. <laughs> so, so then, so I, when, when, when the pandemic came and, and Daybreak had to shut down, um, I luckily knew the caregiver that was helping the neighbor across the street who passed away. And I got in contact with her. She came and met mom, they hit it off. And so what I said to mom is, Debbie would like to come and be your companion for the day. We never said caregiver or babysit, anything like that. It was to be your companion, to have fun with. And they were such a good fit. They played dominoes for hours, um, card games, like a simple war card game where you're just flipping it over. Each flips a card over and whoever has the highest card gets them. But it's something for them simply to think about, mm -hmm. you know, and oh, which one's the highest? Um, she would push mom around the neighborhood in a wheelchair and mom got to visit with people. Debbie was very chatty and already knew a lot of people in the neighborhood. So I had, when Debbie first came, I stayed the first couple of visits to get Deb more acclimated and, and doing, but something that Deb gave me a gift of is even if I didn't have, I always felt like I had to leave the house or something to go, but I would be really tired. She said, go take a nap. I've got things covered. Don't feel guilty. Go take a nap. And I would, I would go in my room and, and oh my gosh, I got such a good night's sleep because maybe the night before or that week, mom was off on days and nights. So um, don't be afraid to ask for help or don't feel guilty accepting the help. And I, I, it, a lot of times it's just networking, asking friends, asking people, you know, do you know of anybody that, that does home care? A lot of people do it on the side. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't need a nurse. I just needed a companion, you mm -hmm. know, and it really worked. And I love the way, Linda, that you framed things for your mom um, that didn't make it sound uh, like someone was taking care of her or yes. demeaning her or diminishing her in any way. Yes. Um, it was to support you and she loved you and she wanted to do what was going to be good for you. So yes. language we, means a lot. We tried to give her her dignity as best as we could all throughout. Beautiful. Um, Debbie, do you want to talk really quick about the, the food? Because I know there were issues with your dad. That was one of the challenges you had from a distance was him eating properly. Yeah, yes. I'll, I'll talk briefly about that. 
um, again, in a small town that doesn't even have a grocery store. Mm. I knew it was going to be difficult to um, assist him to live independently. Um, before he be, um, became diagnosed with dementia, he and a lady friend had a really nice situation worked out where they would split the groceries at that time, which was their mid 80s, drive to the grocery store in neighboring 40 minutes away towns, split the cost, and then she would prepare the meals. They would eat their meal together in the evening. They had a nice senior center for $2. They could get a hot meal and it was an outing. They would always go there. And of course, breakfast can be oatmeal or cold cereal or whatever. But she then became ill and had to go back to Chicago and live with her family for a while. And he was stuck because he never learned to cook. My mother always did all the cooking. So I, um, I said, not a problem. What I did most of the time was doubled any kind of casserole or um, meal that we were having, my husband and I, and then just take the rest of it and, and divide it into individual meals that he could then put down in the refrigerator. And um, similar to that right there, um, he could, um, I could direct him after they were frozen here at my house, I would prepare them. And if you think about it, you need 24 to 28 meals for dinner every month. So I would do it on a weekly basis or every other week basis, freeze them in my freezer, label them and take them up to his freezer. And uh, that worked well for years. I'd take a picture before leaving so that I could see how well stocked we were and then have a game plan for the following week. So that worked extremely well for me because then I could be sure he had a, um, you know, a vegetable and a, a protein with each evening meal. At first, he could navigate all of that. Dad, it's the day before. Let's take that down, put it in the refrigerator to start to fall. And then dad put that on a plate, cover it with a napkin and put it in the microwave on three. But then in the later, like, you know, Two years ago, he stopped being able to manage that um, thinking. So I had to have caregivers come in. But this way, we had a supply of meals that the caregiver could just access and use. So that worked well for me. And it is not rocket scientist. Anyone <laughs> who's ever done that for their own families knows how to do that kind of thing and it, it, it looked worked. good it did look <laughs> good and Debbie I love the idea that you made them you know as you made your own meal you would pack them away freeze them at your house so you weren't spending a whole weekend or a day cooking exactly 25 meals by the time you went you already had them a variety of things in the freezer yes good idea exactly yep Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about placement. All of you have experienced the placement process, um, whether it was uh, emergency because of hospitalization or a planned placement. So Debbie, let me talk with you. Um, when did you know it was time and how did you, how did you make that happen? How'd you get him there? Um, we knew it was time from the many visits and you can see the, the decline and the confusion and the phone calls and the crises. Remember, I talked to you about that winter of 2021 when I started going up every weekend. Um, by the time April rolled around, April of last year, um, he fell one day at lunchtime when his lady friend was over having lunch. He went out, wandered to one of the um, the the buildings, the outbuildings that he has, and just simply fell backwards on his hand. Nothing was broken, but he tore off the skin of the thumb because there were rocks in there. And just navigating that 
issue of, okay, now she can't drive him, but I have to call a caregiver to come assess the situation. It was too difficult for the clinic to deal with in Paul Paul's. So she had to take him to an urgent care in, in uh, Cumberland. Mm. It was kind of the writing on the wall that we'd been waiting through COVID and praying. And I swear to you, the, the biggest dilemma on my mind and on my heart was how am I going to take my dad who doesn't want to leave his house to a facility when I can't even go through for a tour mm. to see what it looks like, drop him off, and he would have to stay in his room. And that's the way it was in February mm -hmm. and March of last year, stay in his room because even though he had two vaccinations, they couldn't be sure that he wasn't carrying it into the other residence. And then my not being able to come and visit, you know, different state, different location, and everybody's in masks. It just didn't even make sense. So we treaded water through the spring while I went to visit the places in Frederick. We knew we would bring them to Frederick. And um, as I got, I, what I did was visited eight places that I was in a, able to go in to, narrowed it to two, and then had my brother and his wife come and the four of us went to visit the top two. And then uh, we knew we couldn't tell my dad because he would refuse to get in the car. Mm. And he's bigger than we are. He's six feet. And, um, you know, he, there would have been no putting him in the car. So we didn't tell him and didn't tell the caregivers until a few days before the move. And then paid them two weeks after, to be fair. Um, I readied the room and um, did everything on this end. My brother and his wife went up and we tricked him into thinking he was going to a doctor in Frederick to have that doctor look at his thumb that was still hurt from mm -hmm. the fall. And uh, we, we did that and then we were um, you know, shuffled out and he went to lunch with the marketing person. Prior to that, a week earlier, I brought him to that um, facility but it really didn't matter because he didn't remember even a week later, but I just felt better about it, you know, that I wasn't dropping him off at some place he'd never even stepped inside of. So we had to trick him and then get him here and then go through the process of the backfill of, you know, dealing with his property and cleaning out all of the, the outbuildings and all of that. I mean, if you, um, advice to the viewers, right? If you had to do it over, is there anything you would do differently or anything you can recommend if somebody's in a situation like that with a person who, who physically, right? You can't hog tie him and take him. No, I think we did it the best way we could have. Mm -hmm. Hindsight. Um, and he tried to escape that very same night. So the beautiful room that was the best I could find ended up going to somebody else because he had to be moved to memory care. Memory care. So that's an interesting takeaway, right? Your best laid plans. Yep. Um, sometimes all that stress and anxiety and effort um, in the mm -hmm. end doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter. Right. Larry, right. how about Larry, how about your experience? You had multiple placements, yes? Yes. Yeah, so my dad um, he fell and we're not sure exactly how it came about, but some they kept him overnight for observation. And lo and behold, the next morning we discover the man who walked into the hospital now has a broken hip. Oh. And so he had surgery for that and rehab. Uh, he came back home. We had a caregiver coming into the house to assist him. He had a walker. A stepmom refused to give up the throw rugs, and somehow dad stumbled and fell. 
and uh, back into the nursing home. Um, he, he wound up spending the rest of his life in a nursing home. And while in the nursing home, he broke his neck. And so he had to wear a collar. He was not able to have surgery because he was not a candidate. He, he, he can't remember. We dealt with the same thing with my stepfather is they're supposed to stay in bed, but they can't remember they're supposed to stay in bed. So they get up and then they get injured. Uh, unfortunately, my stepmom started feeding him. Uh, one message, if anybody out there listening, I can get this message to you. Enable, allow and beyond that, enable your family member to do as much as they can and continue to do as much as they can. Because once they lose the ability to do something, it's not coming back. Mm -hmm. So once my stepmom started feeding my dad, then when she wasn't there, the staff had to feed him because he lost that ability. Uh, my stepfather was, uh, he had knee surgery, went bad. He, he, he started out with an auto accident. He was rear-ended, head injury, and then we started to see a decline. He needed knee surgery. The knee surgery went bad, and I think... Uh, I can't remember when or, or Deborah alluded to the effects of anesthesia. I guess I think it was Linda. Yeah. Uh, he had general anesthesia, and every time he had it, it went downhill. He had mm -hmm. uh, he spent a hundred days. They had supplemental insurance, so he spent a hundred days in a nursing home, and then we had someone coming in. Uh, watching over him uh, uh, overnight because he couldn't remember that he wasn't supposed to get up and go to the bathroom. He always had to get up in the middle of the night. And so the caregiver was there for that reason. He, his knee, the tendon, the kneecap tore loose. He wound up having to have his leg fused and he was in and out of several uh, of the, uh, nursing homes in Frederick County over the course of uh, a year and a half. He experienced the sundowner. He was telling us wild stories that we knew weren't mm -hmm. true. Uh, he, he finally wound up in assisted living until at the end, he, he wound up, he was a vet and he wound up in Martinsburg in their hospice unit, which I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, he, he he had a as good an end as you can have, I guess, when you're at that stage of life. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's um, it, I, we're fortunate in our family that there's a lot of kids, and so you know there were a number of us to to be there. I, I can tell you, it's going to be a lot more difficult for somebody who is you know got no siblings, or the siblings are across the country. Uh, there are resources out there. My sister actually was so appalled at what my dad went through that she started a business herself advising families because we didn't know what to do. We're just kind of blundering along trying to figure out, well, what do we do? You know, it's like most people. Sure. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's good to seek professional advice. Uh, you know, and, and I would strongly urge that, that you do that, so. Larry, that's good advice. There are lots of resources here in Frederick County um, that really you probably don't know anything about unless you've stepped a toe into this caregiver world. So um, to, to, to come to events like this, to learn about what's out there, to ask questions, um, to make at least one professional connection and pretty lucky we're all so close here in this community that one of us will refer you to somebody else and help you along the way. Um, the directory. <laughs> yeah, yes, good advice, Linda, good <laughs> advice. Um, so really quickly, I'm looking at the clock and we are, we are, there's so much to talk about and you guys have given such great information. I wanna jump ahead if I could and talk about coping, right? How um, caregiving is hard physically, it's hard emotionally. Um, what, what tips, what suggestions, what, things would you do differently or do the same again as far as coping with the whole process uh, and taking care of yourself? Linda? I should have asked for help earlier. 
I should have listened to my brothers <laughs> earlier than what I did. And, but I, I, I did, and we got the help and, and we got through it. I, um, as far as coping, it, it's, it comes down to like Larry said, communicating. And, and I was lucky that my brothers were so supportive because they weren't close by, but came when they could, or when I asked, visited as often as they could and were there. But on the day-to-day, 24-hour -day, seven, it was me. And it's asking for the help and accepting, accepting the help. Um, and then it, it also was accepting having, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but when, when mom broke her leg last year and in, at the hospital, they said they couldn't do any more. She had a bad heart. And so I was able to bring her home, but with the help of hospice. And that at first was hard to accept, but they were so great in explaining everything and walking us through that we knew we were making the right decision. And we had, we were able to have a family meeting with hospice. So it wasn't just me making that decision. My brothers and I always made the decision together. We were a team and that is what helped me. And I know them too. We were a, we were a team. <laughs> that is your, you're blessed. And I know not everybody has that experience, but if you are if you are the sibling of the primary caregiver who's on this call, understand that being part of that team can be pretty exceptional. Yeah. Um, Debbie, how about you? What, what's helped you? Your journey is still going. Mm -hmm. um, what keeps you going? What, what suggestions do you have for people? Well, I knew myself and I knew that I was going to need to find out as much information about Alzheimer's and dementia as I could. So from the very beginning, as soon as we got the diagnosis uh, back in 2016, I contacted the Alzheimer's Association and began taking uh, the early stage classes and anything that was offered. I would go in person and um, learn in classes. Now they're being offered online, which in some ways is a little bit easier mm -hmm. for people. Yeah. Um, I make contact with McGean, who is on here. Put your contact information up, McGean. And I'm constantly referring new people to this journey to McGean because she has access to a lot of resources that she can just put in an email and get folks started. I read every book I could on the subject and I got involved with two support groups. Um, which were very helpful to me, especially while we could meet in person. Not so much while we were meeting on Zoom, but I still met and um, still came away with some good ideas. Um, I called the Alzheimer's hotline several times during the period of time we were trying to take my dad's car away. That has to be one of the big ones. Um, especially for a man, I think, who's been driving for 70 years, 75 years, probably. Um, and I prayed every day for things like making it through COVID without having to make a placement before then, because I'm blessed. I can go visit him every day and the lion's share of the care is in place, but I do the little things that I can still do for him. You know, that's something that we didn't talk about, um, that even when you place someone, you're still very much the caregiver, right? Yep. Your role is different, but you're still the caregiver and it's still yep. critical. Yeah, yeah. So those are the ways that I cope. Talking a lot, I walk, um, try to walk for exercise and I talk with my walking partners and um, I also try very hard to um, keep myself active and involved with making things and selling them to benefit the Alzheimer's Association. Um, because to me, if I'm helping someone, then I feel a little bit better about this sad situation. It's a great way to reframe it. Larry, how about you? How, 
how have you um, gotten through this? What are your recommendations for others? Remember you love them. Mm -hmm. Remember they love you. You know, they brought you into this world if it's your parents. Um, you're gonna miss them when they're gone. I lost three parents in uh, two months. Uh, my mom first, uh, my step, my father next, and my stepdad next, and that, that's a lot. Um, I lost my father-in-law three months later, and then uh, you just have to count your blessings. You really do. It, it's easy to look. It's easy to feel get down when you mean when you're down. It's just it's easy, but you can't fall into that trap because. You know, one day all you're going to have left is the memories mm -hmm. and uh, you just have to really remember the good times. We, we did a lot of reminiscing with my, my stepfather in particular. Uh, my dad didn't know anybody at the end. He didn't know who he was or he didn't know anything. Uh, my, uh, my mom had a stroke, so it was just all at once she was gone overnight. So it, it, none of us knows when we're going to go, but I, I tell you, you just got it's. I just remember you love them because it gets very trying when they're being difficult. Um, but you know, just got to help you imagine you're in the same situation. So good advice, really good advice, Larry. Um, and I'm sure that got you through plenty of a uh, plenty of long nights. Um. Larry and Linda, you know, now you are in this post caregiving role or Larry sort of in a post caregiving role. How, how, um, how did you navigate that? That wasn't easy, was it? In the beginning for me, I, I felt very guilty at the freedom all of a sudden I had and was enjoying, but it was at the bittersweet loss of mom. And then all of a sudden, all right, I can do whatever I want, but what do I want to do? And trying to fill my days because 24 seven, I was devoted to her. Mm -hmm. So that was a big adjustment. Hospice counseling actually helped. I talked with somebody for about a half an hour and they were saying how normal that is. So again, reaching out, talking, communicating with friends, communicating with my brothers, um, as far as when mom passed, the gift she gave to us is she had gone to a seminar back when she was 79 on planning your funeral and things like that. And she had already picked out and paid for her casket. And we already had at the family plot. So all of that was done. But when we got her will out, unbeknownst to us, she had all these notes in there. What she wanted to look like, no red lipstick. You know. <laughs> what she wanted to wear, the songs that she liked, the hymns. It was such a gift to us mm -hmm. at that time because she actually, unbeknownst to her, she planned everything because we could just fit in her wishes. Uh -huh. And it, it, so that, that, that I would say, if you can, you know, you don't have to say you're planning for the funeral, but what, what are some of your favorite hymns, mom or dad, you know, or, um, if, if you take them to someone's funeral and they say, oh, I really like that prayer or this or that, you know, write it down. You know, little things like that can make you feel better that you're doing something you knew they, they would like. Good suggestions. Uh, Larry? Um, I'm not really, you know, it's, there's a sense of loss, they're gone, you know. Um, there's always a lot of details you have to attend to when somebody's mm -hmm. gone. Um, and I just, I fall back on, you know, trying to be positive about it, remember the good times. Mm -hmm. um, pictures are important, looking back at, you know, photo albums. Mm -hmm. uh, our photo collection on our phones, you know, and we, we do reminiscing, you know, we get together. We, when my mom died, uh, after she died, we had a, a family gathering and all of us got together and 
quite honestly, we, one of the things we did was we sorted through a lifetime of cards, greeting cards. Oh. And so, you know, my mom never threw away any card she ever got oh. from what we could tell. <laughs> So that was kind of good, you know, in memory of mom on her birthday, the, the, my cousins all came up, a lot of them lived down in Northern Virginia and we got together. So um, it's different, you know, I, you, you just, uh, you kind of got to move forward. Mm -hmm. I can also say as a caregiver, I feel and felt very at peace when mom went, because I knew I had done everything for her. She was able to be at home with family, but I was just very at peace when her time came, you know, and I was lucky to have her up until she was 90. You know, I can't ask for anything more than that. You know, I just, so I had a very peaceful acceptance. It's a gift. At being a caregiver one, gave me a other, lot of a lot of peace. One other thought too. So it was a little different. My mom died instantly, but she yeah. was gone. When my dad died, he had basically we we I felt as if he had died already because mm -hmm. he was his mind was gone and it was just you know he 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 died of pneumonia. He choked on food because he wasn't losing his ability to swallow. And, um, but I really felt like we had lost him years before because he, there was just, you know, it was just what else we had, we had to honor his memory and provide him with the best carry he had, even yeah. if he didn't know what was going on. Um, I, at this time, I'm going to ask, we are almost really already out of time, but I want to wrap it up. But if our viewers have any questions, I invite you, please um, put them into the chat box. Um, and while folks are doing that, I will just ask each of you if you have any, any maybe your number one tip for a caregiver or your, your, your final last words. Mine, I keep going back to what my brothers always said, is you got to ask for help. Don't wait till too late and take care of yourself so that you can be strong enough to take care of your loved one. Because it is a lot of times a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? good advice, Linda. Debbie, how about you? I would say one thing we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, but those who are early in the um, journey is you have to get to an elder care attorney and get the paperwork mm -hmm. The, the powers of attorney paperwork and the medical directives done mm, because you're going to need that for everything, everything. And they want copies of it. So before they'll even speak to you, you have to get copies of it made and send those off to wherever it is you're trying to navigate. We did that in 2016, the same year that he was diagnosed. Because if you if you wait too long, they won't. She said, "I have to see him here to know that he is of sound mind and body." Wow. Larry, any your final words? Remember, remember you love him. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important mantra when yeah. things when things are thick. You you got to keep that um, that going through your mind. Remember that you love them. And they loved you. Mm -hmm. um, last chance. We don't have any questions. Uh, you guys covered, provided so many great tips and suggestions and um, said it really plain and real. And I, for one, greatly appreciate it. I know that our viewers do too. Um, we really appreciate your time and sharing these very personal journeys uh, with everybody here today. Um, we did record this. We will provide the recording uh, on the Elder Services Provider Council uh, website as soon as we get it all put together. And uh, I do invite everybody to mark your calendars. May 11th is our next uh, presentation. Uh, we have Emily Spear, who's a registered dietitian with Frederick Health, talking about navigating dietary changes. So 
Um, please join us. Please tell other people about our webinars, as Linda said. Um, you know, any, uh, actually all of you said, any place you can get an opportunity to get a bit of information, uh, mm -hmm. it can be really helpful. So help us spread the word. Um, I, you know, hearing from um, folks in the chat box, thanking each of you for sharing your journey, uh, a helpful collection of wisdom. So uh, again, I thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'll send out an email with that recording when we get it put together. Uh, and you should be getting now the invitations coming, not from me directly, but from the ESPC Frederick uh, email. So um, please, please pass those on. Please share those with other people. And uh, again, we appreciate everybody. Thank you. Thank you all caregivers so much. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you.